Salutations, everyone, and welcome back to, do you know, The Last Days of Mexico. I'm your host, Mr. Uh, Mexico Lover still. I bet you know that, you know that by now, really. Uh, we got a lot to talk about. It's 1964 and the anvil. A procession led by a priest in the black cassock passed between rows of manicured shrubs. They entered an elaborately carved Baroque church smothered with red, white, green banners bearing uninspiring PRI slogans. On the other side of the square, three old men in hand-stitched linen shirts sat around a table outside a cafe. They scowled at the parishioners between sips of carayillo. The oldest of them, bald and sporting a bushy gray mustache, snubbed out a cigarette in an ashtray. Unbelievable, they can hold their festival of ma the massacres on the ba Bajillo, or Bajillo, but our permits for St. Nicholas Day get denied without comment? Gosh darn rats. It's a sad thing indeed to see Mexico leader people away from God replied the youngest man. Young was perhaps an exaggeration. He was well into his fifties, and his wavy gray hair still clung to his scalp. The third simply sat and listened, occasionally puffing on a cigar. Perhaps forty minutes passed in this way before the contact arrived at the coffee house. He was younger than any of the men at the table, not quite forty by their estimation. He had an unassuming face and wore a loose-fitting blue suit. A mustachioed man spotted him first and waved him over. I must thank you again for your generous donation to the P PAN. Even here in Querétaro, it is nearly impossible to challenge a PRI. The older man solemnly nodded. The pan congressman began again. We have a much better standing in the state congress now, and we are already planning to loosen restrictions on public religious events in the city. This is only the first step of many, of course. New elections are forthcoming, and we would be delighted to see you at the party conference in the federal district to discuss campaign strategy. At this, man beamed. Even the silent one was unable to suppress a grin spreading from his face. It would take many years, but God would return to Mexico once again. It would he would, they would make sure of it. There's no authority except that which God has established, to send or not to send. This, this is not a good idea, not at all. Echeverria murmured, looking at this letter containing the latest demands for the protesters. He stared out the window, contemplating branches shaking slightly under wind, and felt a slight kinship with them. My, how sick I am of these little nuisances. It's also tiresome dealing with them. Meanwhile, the whole area burned surrounding the Carolina building is in chaos, but... Echeverria showed off, realizing the lack of other compelling choices. The observation he had made earlier about brute force crackdowns and entering the grounds with the army ordered to fire at will being a PR nightmare, and generally useless, was still true. Perhaps we need more, more, to move things along quicker. I could ask the president over this. His Excellency could leverage his popularity. Or I could ask the president-elect to go in for it, to build his own image and strengthen the report with the student population. Equally, I and Governor Castillo could hold, just go in ourselves. Echeverria pinched his brown side. This isn't easy. I can see arguments on both sides for all of these. At last, after pacing back and forth in the office for what must have been the 30th time that evening, Echeverria reached a conclusion. President, president-elect, uh, go in ourselves with Castillo. Um, that's a good idea, actually. We have some coffee here, too. If you go in Castillo, they already hate him, so why would they go with him? See, the Senate of the President, um, who's popular, people know him, they kind of like him, or the new guy, who the Pueblo did not really want, I think. That could be a PR disaster for him. This might lower his legacy, but send the President in. And do we have anything else here that we really want to do? Uh, I don't know. That's why we're looking at it. Uh, public housing is not bad. Stimulation. Relief. Quality of life. Still there. Mechanization. Still there. Um, I'm still not against doing this one. Uh, is there anything we do for El Tapado? I mean, this is in the past. 55, 90, 30. Yeah, no, okay then. Well, that's the case. You know, I don't mind doing maybe a little bit more, uh, un better unemployment. Uh, which one of these shows unemployment? Ah. So it's about, what, 37% there? 30, 39%, that's not good. Ooh, 47% in the southwest, that's not ideal. That's even worse. Ooh, that's even worse. Well, so in this place, it's not bad. How about unemployment a little bit more? Okay, quite a bit more stimulation too, which is nice. Uh, what is the decrease here? 1.74%? Yeah. Economic stimulation decreases by a certain amount, but it's also mitigated by urban quality of life. Huh. Interesting to know. Sent to what end? God, I knew it, gosh darn it, I knew it. I knew it was a bad idea. Were a Cheverio more emotive than he actually was, this would be sort of the thing he would be saying. Right now, as the president of the United Mexican States was beleaguered of the BUAP, a more volatile version of Echeria might have heard his hand slamming the table in his anger and worry. Instead, he remained on the radio with Lopez Mateos and his secretary detail, Your Excellency. 
Please inform me what's going on over there. It's abject chaos at Chevaria. Those national Catholics, or whoever the heck they are, the counter protesters, have turned hostile and are now riding across the entire campus. Security details tell me that some of them are even armed, though gunfire is still limited. I tell you, it's madness over here. But Chiveria shook a little. You should have known better than to have soldiers be sent in to draw those cler uh, clericalists up. Clericalists up. We conclude, Your Excellency, what should we do? The sign response was clearly audible, even over the crackling stick. I can't risk this, Chiveria. I need to get out of here. Ah, uh, my head is killing me. Bowing his head in defeat and resisting the urge to sigh, Chiveria agreed at once, Your Excellency. So, we'll maybe go back and do that one. I want to see if we can do that one a little better, maybe. Oh, Hades is falling apart. And thereafter. They continually harshen their demands, licenciado, with a meeting having failed. Yes, I understand that clearly now, officer. Now leave me alone. I need to figure out a way forward in this mess. The door closed. Echeveria thanked his lucky stars that they had not seen the man's faces as they left. If there had been scorn, Echeveria might have about started a shout. If worse, uh, there, there had been pity, he might have thrown something. Well, he might as well have. Leaning forward into the desk, um, Echeveria put his head to his hands. How embarrassing this all is. Had I not gone ahead with these stupid, uh, chaotic disguised as Machiavellian plans to set off counter protests and false flag riots across the gosh darn city, I wouldn't be sitting here with my face trying to boil itself off in embarrassment, now would I. And the meeting is off. Echeveria felt an anger and spite he'd never felt since childhood, combined with desperation and more than a little bit of fear. His hand shaking slightly began to dial a telephone number. Special Force Commander your service, Lesson Seattle Echeveria. Thank you, General. I need you to send a command over your special operations forces into the BUAP complex to release the hostages. That will teach you what their place at long last. Order thrown out of whack. All right, everyone. So it's October now, and we finished off, uh, you know, unified revolution. And this time, instead of that, the three options we had earlier between the president, president elect, as well as the other one um, with the Castillo or Castilla. Um, yeah, look at that. That's really nice. Uh, we decided I went with the president elect and see what happens. We've not got an event yet, so we'll see what happens. But the embers of the Porfiriato, the Mexican Revolution is incomplete. Lopez Mateos would never say these words, but he feels them burn within his heart. He sees them enacted each day in the tragedy of the Puebla, and the feudalism of Oaxa, Oaxaca, and the backwardness of state governments across the country. No more. The party's packed with Kakiyu, Kakiyu landowners, and in collectivization pursue with renewed vigor. The growing web of connections between state governments, commercial interests, and the far right will be torn up under the threat of the CEN intervention. Indigenous communities will be granted resources through fair land demarcations while leaving enough space to support industrial growth in their impoverished regions. Backward states will be aggressively modernized. Pasteurization is just a start, but there's still a little time. More quality of life, popularity, more loyalty from the peasants. We like that. So, happy October, everybody. It's already October 17th. Nice. How's the economy looking? Well, at least it's green. We got up to a good credit rating, which is good. Um, growth is not bad. Growth, I should say. Nice. Unemployed population. I still want to lower that too if we can. Um, in there. Oh, working standards, urban quality of life. That's still important to do, but still. Where's worker loyalty right now? Still pretty good. I like it. Ooh, debt crisis. A regional debt crisis will occur in the southeast. Oops. How do you reduce debt? Oh, okay, so population stuff. Base simulation goes down, simulation doesn't change. Kill welfare spending? No, can't do that one. Can't do this one either. Neglect these? No. Okay, so that's how you do that. Interesting. I'm glad I learned. So there, we can't do anything else there, which really sucks. Moderately active. So the southeast is forever screwed now. Okay, good to know. Slightly urban. How much debt do you have? We're okay. Good. And ever to the Porfiria. That's right. Uh, we're just last one, so we're gonna do this one next. And for the revolution once more. 
The Mexican Revolution is one of the defining moments of our history, and most certainly the defining moment of the PRI. Our party was born for the Mexican Revolution, and has carried forward its spirit ever since in promoting Mexico as a free and fair place for all. Honeyed words, such as that, are only as effective as the actions behind them, however, and President Lopez Mateos has proven that the revolution can still live in Mexico. This sort of figure he cuts on the world stage and a renewed focus on the well-being of the people, all geared in the PRI to a progressive stance reminiscent of the bold strides the revolution took back in the day. It is our history just as much as it is our future. A current of revolution that lives on through the positive democratic system. The people who know it in their hearts, Mexico's way is not stagnation, and a change is still possible. Hey, yeah, looks pretty good. A chance of freedom. As soon as he stepped out in the open air, he, the glare of the sun blinded David Alfaro Sequeiros as his eyes adjusted. Uh, he felt the firm grip of his wife's hand wrapped tight around his arm. He moved his hand to clasp here. Just a few more steps, David. The car is just over there, Angelica said softly as she began leading him across the yard. Away from the dark and cold confines that had defined his life for the past few years, he followed along, breathing harshly through his teeth as the stiffness of his limbs remained an obstacle to walk to freedom. Yet he knew in his heart that this was no true freedom, just another imprisonment. Finally, the two of them stepped, uh, reaching the outer gates of the prison, and stepped forward towards the awaiting car. Uh, Siskerios shuffled himself into the passenger seat as Angela, Angelica... Uh, got herself seated and began the drive back to their home. Well, the presidential pardon surely won't come after you again, especially if you lay low and keep your head down. Sicarios, I need you. You can't throw it all away. Throw it all away for what? Justice, freedom, a life with dignity, one worth living? He sighed, called me his emotions. I'm sorry, I'm more grateful than you can imagine being out of that hell. I just want to rest now. He moved a hand to a hold Angelica's, even as the seething fire continued to dully burn deep in his heart. As they finally approached their home, David noticed a dark car parked further down the street. Suspicion seized him for a moment. Was this a government agent? Were they about to interrogate him about his colleagues? His rushing thoughts abated as a dark car started up and began driving off. Perhaps his imprisonment truly had turned him mad, or perhaps he would forever be haunted by shadows and suits. A flame flickers and wavers. Very cool. Jack Jones, huh? Oops. Oh, my bad. Let me go back. I accidentally clicked on that by accident, but we'll read this next one, too. Look at human president. A man's legacy is the most important thing he can leave behind. It is an everlasting mark on the world, a part of him threaded through history even after he's gone. And President Lopez Mateos has left behind a fine legacy for himself as his time as Mexico's leaders end. He's a firm believer in anti-imperialism, and the national interest in an effort to rebuild his country, a reputation as a prime example of an independent nation, and the creator of countless social programs and initiatives designed to increase the cap our capabilities as a nation and improve the quality of life for all. As enduring idealism and high-minded reforms have paid off and truly made Mexico stand out in the crowd. While some elements of crimes and authoritarian who would do anything to silence dissent in his country, these criticisms cannot stand in the way of such an impervious legacy and will be forgotten. Whatever happens, Adolfo Lopez Mateos' memory will be cherished by our people now and forever. We will set a standard above the morass of politics for future generations, future generations to aspire to. It's Jack Jones. Oh, revolutionary front. Look at that. Interesting. They went hard, hard left in the UK, even though Germany stood down, Speer stood down. Revolutionary Workers Front. They're a complete socialist. Wow. <clears throat> a higher duty. Desperation breeds resourcefulness. Rodrigo knew every route, every souvenir stand, and every restaurant that the most oblivious tourists were at. The downtrodden, or downtown, historic district was his playground. A blank canvas upon which he could perform or perfect his art form. Rodrigo unloads his latest haul among the rough-necked friends. A wide cheer, a couple dollars there, a chain, purse, you name it. Fencing wasn't lucrative, but it gave Rodrigo something to work with, at least in the monetary sense. Every day he would come home to Casa Grande, scared to talk to his father, worried he would inquire about his source of income. Jose, uh, or Jose maybe, knew that he'd been fired from the glass blowing job weeks prior, and Rodrigo knew he could find out, would find out eventually. Something had to give, and honest work had to be done. Rodrigo came home one afternoon and looked his father straight in the eye, handing him papers. Father, here you go. Jose sat down in his chair, reading the document as a silence permeated the room. Rodrigo, to anticipation, or anticipating his father's reaction. After a minute, a neutral sigh leaves Jose's mouth as he looks up to his son. That army, huh? You weren't in the army? It's honest work, Papa. His father had always had a way of hiding his emotions. Those eyes told the story. A deep stare towards the ground, followed by him closing them. Are you ready for this, Rodrigo? Yes, Father, I am. This cup overflows. This I did not expect. No, not quite at this level. It's exceeding beyond my wildest dreams. That was a refrain that went through Lopez Mateos' and semi head semi-regularly when the migrants were tolerable at least. The president had set two goals for himself on entering the National Palace. Firstly, he would revitalize the institutional revolutionary party, which had fallen into a state of discredited near moribundity. Secondly, he would leave his own legacy unassailable. As the work began in 1958, he thought he might just be able to stabilize the PRI, if nothing else. <clears throat> Securing his own legacy, however, could possibly be a thing that could happen, or could it not be? But the results, current results, 
These were not what he had expected, none at all. More than ever, the bureaucracy was filled with people enthusiastic about their mission. More party militants were out on the streets and in the social circles of the Mexican people rallying the compatriots so to support the institutional revolution. Better still, even with the four years left until the Olympics, the president could feel the excitement about the return of the revolution and the preparations for the great games. <clears throat> I hope my successor can build on this, Lopez Mateos murmured. I hope Mexico can keep succeeding the way it did on my watch. I hope the revolution's legacy can be fully honored at long last. I dare say I feel more hope about the possibility of success than I did the first day, though. Yeah? Uh-oh. The straw that broke, uh, the back. The Hospital 20 de Novembro was one of the most important medical centers in the greater Mexico City area. One would have expected that this meant working conditions that respected the needs of the doctors and other medics working there, but the doctors could swear any number of oaths before God, and man, that, that was never the case. And what is worse, it was becoming less and less the more so time passed on. Evening came, then morning no relief yet followed. Supplies went missing at the worst possible times. Some suture could be needed to save an injured mother's life, and it would emerge that the materials had been sold up by some scavenger. Scalpels would be taken away for scrap, and the new ones would be take two weeks to arrive. Cleaning was sparse, reinforcements infrequent, and rest in, or vacation only a possibility when doctors fell down unconscious. One might think that there's no way it could get worse, but it did. His hands shuddering. The director opened the directive from the Ministry of Health. He stammered out, due to economic situations beyond the control of the Ministry of Health, doctors and other staff at hospitals uh, throughout the Republic cannot receive their regular pay bonuses at this time. There was silence, and the moans, shouts, and tears. Ah, that's one back. Real productivity goes down a little bit, but that's okay. We are nearing the edge of this one. Extremely productive, extremely productive, slightly productive, moderately productive. Moderately productive. I'd like to build down here, but just is too much debt. How much does it add? Five million? Slightly unproductive. Well, let's make it productive then. Well, this will get even worse. How much debt do we have? That's fine. Bitter regrets. The orange rays of twilight cast odd shadows across the grounds of the Palacio Nacional. Lopez Mateos took a sip of tequila as he watched them fade away. Despite the late hour, he had no intention of going home. His wife didn't want to see him. His favorite mistress was busy elsewhere. We all need our mistresses in our lives. Turning back to his desk. <clears throat> His eyes returned to the pile of photos, reminders of his past accomplishments. He looked over many, but he couldn't stop thinking about the meeting he had a few hours earlier. The assembled PRI officials had listened attentively as he asked them to support his chosen successor and even nodded politely at the end. But the eyes betrayed the truth. The ambitious schemers in the party were not satisfied with his choice and he lacked the power to make them obey. Now they were there to make trouble and the next president would pay the price for his failure. Reaching for another bottle of tequila, Lopez Mateos noticed a paper hidden between the two photos. He unfolded it to find a letter from a peasant named Vivania. He soon remembered why he saved it. <clears throat> the woman had been a beneficiary of his presidency's, presidency's first round of land reform. She'd been so happy with her allotment that she'd enclosed a copy of the transfer slip with Lopez Mateos' signature on it. He, she talked about how prosperous a farm was under her husband's stewardship, how they'd use the money to put their children through school, and she thanked the president profusely. Lopez Mateos finished reading, and for the first time that evening, he smiled. The PRI might defy as well, but the people of Mexico were grateful for all that he'd done. Sitting down his drink, he continued looking through the photos. Can one misstep overshadow so much good? Oh, off actions will to a significantly decrease. Well, what were we supposed to do? I mean, the system it's set up is not really great. To stress, the effects of Mateos' failures may manifest themselves sooner rather than later. The battle for the nation ends, huh? Well, at least we had political power for a little bit. And at least we used it, too, before it got bye-bye. You did a body collapse. And why were we meant to sit around and tolerate this? As loud as Father Hidalgo, the doctor's cries of rage sounded throughout the nation, and nowhere they were louder than in Hospital 20 de Novembre. Papers which dictates and threats from the Ministry of Health lay neglected on the table. Meanwhile, the medical professionals were resolved to take decisive action of a sort not yet seen in the nation. A letter was sent to the director. We, doctors and interns of the Hospital 20 de Novembre, have determined as follows that until such time as the payments that are due to us for our service and the cruel circumstances under which we work, we will only work in emergency medicine. We will not deal with regular services at all. We advise the leadership of the hospital to focus their minds on the interests of the workers in accordance with the tenets of the institutional revolution and give us our due before the people of Mexico and the world. The director and his hands, once again shuddering, brought the demand to the hospital board. The response, there are 210 signatures? Then fire all of them that wrote this. There will be no subversion on your watch. You hear me? None, darn you. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Another crisis happens. And a boy's inflamed. 
Machiavelli's thesis was not as useful as the Board of Hospital 20 of November hoped. Rather than terrorize the medical profession, <clears throat> it martyred the 210 fired doctors in the eyes of their profession and gave other doctors in the country new ideas to see that to it that their demands for a workplace that could, they would they could tolerate would come to fruition. <coughs> 206 other doctors and medical interns decided to form a union and the tradition of shop floors across a thousand industries to defend their interests. They consecrated it the Asociación Mexicana de Médicos Residentes e Eternos, the Mexican Association of Resident Doctors and Interns, and wrote in the new AMMRI's charter that its intent would be to demand wide-reaching reforms to the state hospitals and the necessary reorganizations to the Ministry of Health to bring that about. The response of the medical authorities was swift. Within two hours of the AMMRI's founding, the first 206 people to sign on were fled or fired from the hospitals. Then there was silence, for about 15 minutes. One way or another, news of the AMMRI's existence got out, and doctors across the country began to follow their lead, and this time with increasing sympathy from some hospital management. <clears throat> Mass walkouts and on a scale unheard of in Mexican medical histories ensued. To tour, the Mexican people began to learn just about what sort of hack their doctors were being put through. It was at this time the news reached the president at Los Pinos. Instead of throbbing painfully as he read, Lopez Mateos reached for more painkillers. It's why I question his reliance on the drugs to which he quipped. I can't very well see a doctor about this now, can I? Huh. Intern target radicalism will increase by 20. Intern radicalism will increase by 25. Time for a new GUI. Now we have no political power because... Stupid reasons. To address the ongoing illegal, illegal labor actions occurring in the hospitals throughout the country, you must collaborate with the IMSS, the ISSDE, CNOP, and of course our security services. While these bodies suggest many approaches to deal with the strikers, all agree that a blood and caustic crackdown would, force, would be forced upon us if we fail to keep the strike's radicalism in check. Additionally, information can be found in the Crestwood Report, but the consensus is that the radicalism must be equal or below the following targets for the state of strikes. He's a DMF. Doctor unions announced strike. Today, the newly formed Mexican Association of Resident and Internal Doctors, or AMMR, announced that medical interns and students will go on strike nationwide. This move comes after numerous public revelations about the poor working conditions doctors regularly face. The president has taken no official action, though he acknowledged some of the union's grievances are legitimate. <clears throat> the strike has dealt a major blow to the Mexican healthcare system. Systems with serious conditions and those of advanced age, including veterans of the revolution, fear they will not receive treatment. Some have accused the strikers of criminal so social dissolution, while the National Confederation of Popular Organizations alleges that the AMMRI is an illegal unit with no rights or to organize. Let's hope this is resolved soon. Well, we have no political power. We're screwed. The strike is over. That'd be nice. We lowered by one. Wow. <clears throat> Out of anesthesia, Federal District has been officially confirmed that AMMRI is on strike. Hospitals have been closed all around the nation, 23 in the Federal District and 20 in other states. They demand the rehiring of all medical staff, solutions to the problems for each office, among other demands. People all across the nation are suffering from the lack of medical care, or the newborn or the elderly. The Mexican people ask if the doctors don't care for their duties anymore, and if they do, why are they striking instead of fulfilling their oath? La Presena, Prensa, has interviewed a patient in Hermosillo or Hermosillo, that is suffering from endometriosis and is desperate need of surgery. The pain is unbearable, she says. I've been waiting for months for the surgery, and now the doctor isn't here to help me. All they give me are some pills that make me feel better, but they don't work. I still feel the same pain as always. I cry every day until I sleep, wishing this pain would end. The woman who chose not to identify herself as one of thousands of civilians who are suffering from the strike. The people cry and the doctors do not listen. They only care about their demands. The governments have yet to state their opinion on the current crisis. La Prensa, December 8th. 1964. At Doctor Strike. Oh god. <clears throat> Full effects of the strike are revealed. Attempt to contact the government. Well, we're screwed. It's not like we can get more political power anyways, you know. The inauguration of Gustavo Diaz Ordaz Bolaños. Well, this, this is looking better. We got the sell 7%, which is nice. We could do a temporary tax cut. Give us twenty political power. Mm. I really don't want to do this one though. All around him, a crowd of the citizens of Mexico City and beyond the citizens had gathered to watch newly elected president assume the highest office in the country. His stomach turned a bit as the sight. At the sight, his worry briefly gripped his mind, but he cast it away. He would not poison his thoughts today. Today was to be the greatest day of Gustavo Diaz Ordaz Bolaños' life. People of Mexico, you put your trust and faith in me and in the institutions of the PRI. I promise you, you will not be disappointed by the results. I will pull out a constitution as I have just sworn before all of you, a constitution which has served to empower you, the Mexican people, for the last four decades. 
Everything will be as it was under my predecessor, prosperous, peaceful, and content. But to continue the great legacy of Lopez Mateos, we must tackle the radicalism and lawlessness that continues to infest the fringes of our society. <clears throat> we must fight for the values of the revolution each and every day, and I promise you we shall. Under my leadership, the ship shall be steady to six more years of calm waters. Around him, the crowd clapped politely. You can see their faces uh, that they were not cut up in the moment like they were when Lopez Mateo spoke. They were not whipped into a frenzy like when the radicals spoke. No, most of them were simply calm, watching history be made. His history. The worry wormed his way back from the depths of his mind. Had he said something wrong? No, he casted doubts once more from his mind. If they wanted to doubt the sincerity of his words, let them. He would prove them that he was as good as Lopez Mateo's. No, he would prove that he was better. And they will all cheer. A lot devoted to the pursuit of this moment. A lot devoted to the PRI. The cabinet will be changed. And perfect dictatorship applies a new facade. And we have less ability. Oh, God. The prodigy's presidency. presidency. <coughs> it's played out all according to plan. The plan of Gustavo Diaz Ordaz Bolaños. <coughs> Excuse me. Having been expected to win uh, by the party and the people alike, Ordaz comes to power with the support of the majority of the institutional revolutionary party apparatus. The golden age of the PRI and the United Mexican States will continue. Economic rejuvenation shall be pursued in order to build off the legacy left behind the President Lopez Mateos and his predecessors. Close cooperation with our ally, the United States of America, will also be pursued. The better to keep Japanese and German fascism at bay. And most crucially, a steady hand will remain in charge of the revolution to defend it from enemies inside and out. Viva Ordaz, viva Mexico. Until this healthcare crisis destroys us. His Excellency the Titan, Americanophile. You get some stability and political power, but everything is not as good without Lopez Mateos. <coughs> Excuse me. Weekly stability is going down, though. Bureaucrat corrosion, loyalty, ancestralist. Uh, I get more political power here, right hand man. I like more stability, too. No leader is guaranteed to succeed if he lacks trustworthy deputies to stabilize a ship in a system with its labors. For Ordaz, this deputy is none other than Luis Echeverria Alvarez, the Secretary of the Interior, in short, Segob. Echeverria is no well known for success in law and more order matters in the Republic, a fact Ordaz knows and respects. For five years as colleagues, with Echeverria previously serving as Ordaz's undersecretary at the Segob, they have developed a close and respectful relationship. Today, the Segob and the President must meet to cement unity and cooperate. Uh, <clears throat> on projects which shall ensure the stability of the revolution. Echeverria will no doubt be even more willing to cooperate than he already would be given that Ordaz has already guaranteed his continuance as Sekob, making him Ordaz's second in command. <coughs> At 3 p.m. this afternoon, this excellency, President Gustavo Diaz Ordaz of the United Mexican States, swore the official presidential oath before thousands of supporters and took the satchel for his own. Following the official inauguration ceremony, the new president gave a speech in which he outlined his policies of stability and cont continuity from Lopez Mateos' administration, particularly with the goal of defending social justice. The new president continued that his cabinet would soon be officialized, although many of the names of his top cabinet positions have already been speculated on by the media. His administration is expected to continue the prominent growth and stability seen under the Lopez Mateos' administration, with new innovations likely to come from the new president as Mexico moves into a new decade of prosperity. Let's see what an insider can accomplish. Oh, subsidize. Facility agricultural exports. Yeah. I like to do that. What is this? Extend Gil Preciado's leash. Huh. Barbara can improve. His imperiousness will be somewhat decreased. Interesting. It's different. Set shutter and moral businesses. Ooh, we'll get more political power. But you lose stimulation. Imperiousness will increase and get more stability. Unique. Attract American investors. Increase American influence. Better unemployed population. Better. Ooh, this is really good. No border for tourists. That's that's weird. Okay. Interesting. That's kind of unique. I like. I, I kind of like the uniqueness. Sondergarten in Germany. Pretty normal. A new path to face. Lopez Mateos finally got out of bed, sleeping in a luxury the former president could now afford. He strolled to his front door to collect his letters and grab his copy of the newspaper. Afterwards, he sat on his sofa and stretched out his legs, glancing over through headlines about the incoming president. The wizened man chuckled to himself. Hmm, it's finally not me at the center of attention anymore. Good luck, Gustav, Gustavo Diaz Ordaz. You need it. A moment of doubt came into Mateos' mind, but his choice of successor, he pondered that the new president would carry on the progress his administration had made. Mateos put down the newspaper beside him, but thought dismissed as quickly as it had arrived. Eh, why am I worrying? I'm sure it'll work out in the end. Regardless, it's not, it's not a headache I'll have to deal with anymore. 
I'll have more important things to worry about now, he said to reassure himself. Mateus felt at ease, with a heavy burden on his shoulders finally being lifted these past few days. No longer present at his home, quieted down, he could take life at his own pace. He hoped that this meant fewer migraines. He could tell with time in his office, and focus his energy on his work on the Olympic Committee, ensuring that it all went without a hitch. Done with his, done with his morning routine, he got dressed and prepared for the day he, he had in store for him, writing the pages of his final chapter. So if that's the case, I want to know where, where is this imperiousness? Um, is it here? Doctor Strike, okay. This Union has not issued a warning. Failing to hit the target radicalism for this Union will give a warning, pushing us closer to brutal crackdown. Approach them, let them wither. The AMMRI are formed only of university students and interns without a stable income to support themselves. They and the strike will be burn out soon. Disorganized. The few doctors that strike against us do not need to be attended to. Let them scream and stomp, they will not change our minds. While some doctors stand with their intern colleagues, most are content with their high paying, prestigious careers. This is causing no trouble. What was this? Target radicalism for the AMMRI in the spirit of Dr. Strike is 20. They're not organized, which is good for now. So it's not there. This is all just a PRI stuff. Because I do want to do some of this stuff, but I, I, I want to know. Imperiousness. Oh, that does imperiousness. Uh, Baragan. Salas. Antonio Carrillo Flores. And Ucheveria, of course. This is really bad for us. Oof. Nice industrial base. It's getting better. Nothing's really going to improve for us, though, here. Maybe academic base, but that's not much. The aftermath. What is this? CTM and CROC condemnation. Intern radicalism will go down. Decrease by 3 5. Disqualify the AMMRI. Within 20 days. Intern radicalism will increase. So even if we were to do all this, that's nine. They get it to twenty. Intern target radicalism twenty. We can maybe get it to twenty. Uh, I just don't see where this is. Maybe I'm. Am I not seeing it right? Uh. There's our laws. Because I like improving poverty rate. But I also like this one too. Show to the moral businesses, you get stability. It hurts stimulation a little bit, 2%. It's not good. Uh, for this state, what, what, what state are we looking at? Yucatan. Very rural. So if we were to hurt stimulation, right now it's 39.99%. Its floor is at 38%. So if we were to lower it, it would go back up to 38%. Which I do kind of like. And you get some more political power here and stability. We got a little more political power that way. Which, like I said, I do like a lot. So, we could try all this. The strike completed. The aftermath. So, is there anything changes here, maybe? Or, I'm going to talk about the seat of power. Um. Let's get more political power. Mateos has gotten Without the support of President Ordaz's most excellent and respected predecessor, his mentor and friend Adolfo Lopez Mateos, there would have been no hope of or Diaz Ordaz getting as far as he did. The President regards it as prudent to be conscious of the debt he owes his mentor. Accordingly, Lopez Mateos will retain the absolute right to contact the President whenever he requires, and Ordaz will continue to seek his advice wherever it is needed. Moreover, the former President will, by decree of Diaz Ordaz, be given carte blanche to proceed with his dream for the 1968 Olympics. Our ribbon tied. Standing tall before a valley of files and paperwork stood Lopez Mateos and Ordaz, amongst rows of tables and filing cabinets, far outside of a simple room, in sunny skies where the tales of glory manifested. And you're just a perfect candidate, Ordaz said, grinning greatly. A honor that you consider me to command the Olympic Committee, Lopez Mateos smiled in return. You know me well. That is my passion. Quite. I have great expectations for you. Just don't work too hard, Ordaz responded. Lopez Mateos blinked, glancing over at his desk. Which become home to a stack of papers and files related to the Olympic Committee. Right, not too hard, but that's a lot of papers. But Drazo addresses the PRI, which is another comment. I mean, people want me to go with Drazo. I will play as him eventually, I promise you that. Not sure when, especially as at the time of this recording, YouTube has completely cut, killed my monetization, but we'll see. Only one week had passed since the inauguration of President Ordaz, but Madrazo approached a party conference podium with decades of restless energy. The president gave a slight nod uh, from the front row. His youth had, and passion would invigorate the PRI. This is why he selected Madrazo to help helm the CEN. 
Madrazo yanked the microphone and free and strode out to the edge of the stage. He said nothing, just stared out of the crowd. At last he began, when I look at you, I see the party, I see the institution. But I do not see the revolution, roared the southern cyclone. I see lines faced with tired eyes, a room stuffed with those that think our work ended 30 years ago. I see fine clothes and flashy watches, stolen from the Mexican peasant, from the Mexican worker, through the shameless corruption. I see golf, gophers and toadies who only know how to please their boss, not to serve the Mexican people. I see you. If Madras could see Ordaz, he would have seen a face uh, uh, blanch with shock. This is not the script they had agreed upon. This was entirely too far. They had to stop before, and therefore I see what must be done. As a leader in our party, my first and foremost objective is to restore the, within it the spirit of the revolution. I am not under any illusions as to the steps that will require. Corruption, audits, frequent and unannounced will be put in place immediately. To enforce the accountability you have so sorely lacked, our party will hold elections within itself to determine candidacy for positions. On and on, Madrazo went, ignoring the horrified expressions of the party members. Some followed out in disgust, or doubt this discomfort and rage spread throughout his body, leaving his shirt soaked with sweat and his hands bald and fists. This cannot continue. Read the room, Madrazo, and the new office. The move had not taken Gutierrez too long, after all. It has been one door down. Though he had been in this room many, many times before, it was now his to survey. The director's chair had a sturdy bulk, as comfortable as it was intimidating. He remembered the latter feeling from his time as a young agent, one of the first in the DFS. A tinted window was a nice touch. To see would not be seen, doubtlessly bulletproof as well. The desk was a true inheritance. Solid mahogany, sufficient breadth to gather, organize, and efficiently dispatch incoming and outgoing reports to draw up for his handgun. The treasure, though, rested discreetly in a corner. The key to the DFS's fearsome reputation lay within a set of gray filing cabinets. A fool might have guessed arms, a novice might have guessed training manuals, but any DFS agent worthy of the name would know that they contain information, information on enemies and on the state. Information on enemies of the DFS, for they were one and the same. And for information, information, now it was his to survey. The Seat of Power Los Pinos, a mansion built in the style of a French palace right in the heart of Mexico City. It had been the official residence of every PRI resident, president except for Lopez Mateos, who never left his home in San Jeronimo. Now it was time for Gustavo Diaz Ordaz and his family to move in. After receiving a tour of the grounds, he took a moment to examine his new office. Looking through the drawers of his new desk, he realized this was his first moment alone since the inauguration. It wouldn't last, of course. Before long, he would again face the questions of reporters and the applause of party sycophants. Men would smile to his face while sharpening knives behind their backs. The action would try to pull him every which way, and the people would make endless demands of him. He felt a crushing weight on his shoulders. Yet, just as doubts began to flood his mind, Ordaz pushed him away. From his earliest days in Puebla to his tenure as Secretary of the Interior, he faced challenges and he had overcome them all in turn. Now, after a lifetime of struggle, he had finally earned the highest office of the land. He would do whatever his job asked of him, and then some. Ordaz poured himself a glass of water, wiped the sweat off his brow, and slicked his hair back. After taking a moment to compose himself, he went out to face the world. Heavy is the head that wears the crown. The titan of the state reveals itself, a new GUI is active in the decision menu. So now we finally get access to this. El Titan. It's a testament to the power of the Mexican Revolution that Ordaz now sits at his home. Uh, born into poverty and raised the ugly duckling of an unsupportive mother, Gustavo Diaz Ordaz has risen to preeminence with only a vast intellect and a prodigious capacity for work as Secretary of the Interior. Those were the methods by which he wielded control over the PRI. Now that he bears the presidential sash, the true strength of his iron grip is revealed. Vigorous discipline and the firm commitment to the law are his watchwords, and the federal party and the state governors will heed his every command. His office demands no less. In fact, his office demands more. Six years of utter devotion, of unimaginable stress curdling his stomach, of schemers and traitors to the revolution lurking at home, abetted by hostile powers abroad, of rebellious youth, riotous leftists looking uh, to overthrow the order he has spent every hour of his life upholding. Six years to withstand the abysmal pressures on Mexico and on himself, or dire force will be unleashed. Imperiousness. 0 to 33 percent. A worker and peasant intelligentsia loyalty will slightly increase. All regions get more base stimulation. At 7 percent. Industrious loyalty will slightly increase. His nascent and imperialness right now. And, and if you get 100 uh, percent, bureaucrat and DFS loyalty will slightly increase. All regions get more urban population. Uh, better, as it looks like it's better uh, sim stimulation decay. Less rural population and urban quality of life goes down. So maybe we want more imperiousness, perhaps? Do we have any other projects available? Yes, in the southeast, but we can't afford the southeast. Um, because they're heavily in debt, and actually, we're over debt. Over in debt. That's not good. Uh... Well, that's not good. The problem is slam. Employers weren't asking any questions anymore. Not after the Baja plan was set in motion, and Enrique had shown his university degree. Not said a word about the pan, and signed on the dotted line. 
And for the moment, Enrique Ruiz had appeared on that page. He had been writing an exponentially expanding payroll. Um, contracts for subcontractors, contracts for steamrollers, requests for concrete mixers, warehouse space, and rail cars on the ever lengthening trains racing into Mexicali. Bids for the immense road work about to begin under the Baja plan. A cup of coffee sat down firmly between his beside his typewriter. Um, Enrique's tired eyes turned from the blurring page in front of him to Senor Iglesias. Head of the company, beneath Iglesias' gray mustache was a small smile. Almost everyone's gone home. I appreciate the hustle, Enrique, wasn't it? There's never going to be another opportunity like this in Baja again. Yes, Senor, and I'm happy. Happy, too. I made a promise that would make a difference for the state. Hey, look at that. Great. Wow, unemployed population, minus 20%. Holy smoking Senors. That's freaking awesome. Quality of life. The fever breaks. Lupita's short break was almost over when the hospital manager snuck into the busy snuck in from the busy hallway. The interns in the break room bristled. Management never showed up unannounced with good news. The balding manager pulled a, out a chair and joined the interns on the table in the center of the room. I had to ask this again of you, he began, though his tone made it clear he had no such misgivings. I'm going to ask you all to pick up another ship this evening. On one of the interns side, I understand that this isn't what any of you wanted to hear the manager say with a frown, but keep in mind that a reputation matters in this field. I wouldn't want any of you to be overlooked in the future if it comes out that you aren't fully dedicated to your work. Lupita clenched her jaw and nodded. None of the other interns spoke up, not until the manager left the room. Anyway, then there came a whirlwind of swearing and threats of violence. Empty ones, of course. They all knew there was nothing to be done, all of them but Lupita. <coughs> we just want to lay down a ticket, you know, she said after Sans returned to the room. The other interns looked at her. There's a new union for our eyes in the federal district. They just got organized a few days ago. My aunt's a nurse in the city, and she called as soon as she heard the news. Smiles spread across the faces of the doctors to be the seeds of the Satillo chapter that A M M R I had been sown. Take it easy, but take it. The right hand. Before we begin, Your Excellency, said Echeverria, I want to thank you again for appointing me to this position. Morda shook his head. No thing need thank me. You performed well as my deputy when I was Secretary of the Interior. You have more than earned the post. Now, what can you tell me about this doctor's strike? My people are compiling reports as we speak. By the time of tomorrow, I'll have a list of all striking doctors in every affected hospital, as well as their demands. Forget about their demands, or dials are interrupted. I want to know who's really behind this. Have you found any connection between these unions and other illegal organizations? Echeverria paused, considering his next words carefully. We are still gathering evidence at this stage, but support from subversive groups haven't been ruled out. Ordaz stood up, clenching his fists. I suspected as much. Thank you, Luis. I expected excellent work, as always. I don't know what I'd do without you. Echeverria smiled politely his presence words. As Ordaz turned to leave, his smile grew into a larger, deeper grin. Ambition lurks in all men's hearts. We'll not see any pressure that is illegal or inconvenient. More imperiousness. Cool. I like a green. Good. Growth, real growth is 7%. We like that. Um, and we're going to keep some political power here to see what we can do. So 7%. Now it's 12%. So now we're at 25. The aftermath. Oh. oh. Second strike. Um, effect in 17 days. New doctor strike decisions become available. Okay, so the second aftermath. So what do we have here? Let them wither. Approach not necessary. So continue to smother them and break it down. Radicalism will decrease by five. Bernardo Olmos Hernandez. The signature was blue and ink. The indecipherable scrawl proclaimed that the hospital director had once been a doctor. Then, the signature had graced thousands of prescriptions and thousands of records, spreading health and knowledge throughout Durango. Now to spread fear, now to spread fear and hate. It was affixed to a short note, typed in black, block letters. The AMMRI entrants had compared theirs and seen the messages were exactly the same. A boilerplate response comp composed in CNOP, or better yet, the Secretariat of Health and Welfare. It told them that they had broken the law by joining an unrecognized union, that the rash action endangered public health, and that their educational grant had been immediately revoked. They would receive no step in bonus or would, and would be ineligible for employment at any ISSST or IMSS hospital. They would never become doctors. From director to director, thousands more signatures flowed. Less simulation, but we do what we must. And allies on the left, Carlos Madrazo is one of the most influential internal critics of the Institutional Revolutionary Party. Oh, look at this. Moreover, he has, over the past years of struggle, become a close ally and personal friend of the new president. Their relationship was crucial where it was a threat of subversive Salinas and his technocratic perversion of the Institutional Revolution attaining primacy. Now it's time to further leverage that relationship for the benefit of the Mexican government. Using his significant power and influence, Ordaz will appoint Madrazo president of the CN, the National Executive Committee of the PRI, effectively president of the party. Since we expect that Madras will act as a lame duck, this appointment will give Ordaz a close ally within the party, build connections with intelligentsia, and silence dissent arising from the students and the middle class. Get more political power, and more loyalty. A midnight call. 
Rosen Dordaz, a sat in his office, frantically reading through reports. The son had said hours ago. Guadalupe would be wondering about him dying now, but he couldn't bring himself to leave. How could he rest while seditious strikes grew ever larger? When he could bear the stress no longer, Ordaz picked up the phone and dialed a familiar number. A moment later, someone answered. Good evening, Mr. President, said the voice of Lopez Mateos. How may I be of service? I'm sorry to bother you so late, Adolfo, but I can't sleep. We still don't have this doctor strike under our control, and I'm worried. I was hoping that you had some advice you could share. Lopez Mateos just laughed. Gustavo, do you remember the railway, railway strikes back in 58? How about Navas' campaign in 61 or when you resurfaced during Kabuki? I was terrified of every single one, but you always came through for me. Our president has to rely on those around him, Gustavo. I had you, and now you've got your own men. Trust in them and trust in yourself, and I know you'll do well. Ordaz, out of deep breath, thank you, Adolfo. I needed to hear that, and I'll get back to bed now. Good night, Mr. President. Rest well. All rights that are laws concede will be zealously respected and reinforced by my government. Our Titan's appearance will greatly decrease. Ooh. Oh, wow, that really, 10%. Whoa, boy. Well, the Mur deserved optimism. Mostly successful. Uh, we're going to have this, please, go ahead. So, GDP, nice, good. Growth was smashing success. Per capita, good, very good. Agronomic productivity, good. Uh, unemployment got a little worse. Or we didn't hit it, but better. But whatever. Poverty, 60%. We had a flat 60%. Get stability, uh, political power, power, and low to increase. From Antonio or. Tiza Ortiz Menya, Secretary of Hacienda and Public Credit. Nice. Exactly what we want. Um, I'm so worried about the Southeast here. Is there anything we could do? Like, because there's a lot of debt. Can we still do a project here in the Southeast? Because, uh, debt. Oh, no, we can do a little bit more, maybe. As long as it doesn't cost too much. Uh, how, much how much wiggle room do we have? About... 70 million. Okay, so we got time. We got, we got, we got space here. Okay, Mapaso Dam. That looks pretty good. The benefits of infrastructure sometimes spread far beyond its original purpose, and with the Mapaso Dam nearing completion deep in the beautiful rainforest along the Gravala, Agrialva River, the project and surrounding infrastructure will no doubt boost the natural tourism of the region, in addition to powering hundreds of villages and towns. All that remains is the construction of the dam structure itself. We got a lot of corruption here, don't we? Doctors join striking interns. Not good. Uh huh. That's pretty strong. Attract American investors. That's very strong. Listen, labor laws. I don't. I like this, but I don't want to lower, lower our imperiousness. Base simulation goes up by 1%, which is nice. Still. Base stimulation uh, unemployment goes better. I really don't want to lower that too much. If we get another one where we can increase imperiousness, we'll take the other one that where it says we decrease it. But doctors join striking interns. Issue mass walkouts and resignations by professional doctors, formation of unauthorized medical unions, AMM. The Medical Society of the General Hospital of Mexico has joined with 21 other in the federal district, 11 from other states, in an independent union referred to as the Mexican Medical Alliance, or AMMM, or AMM. Composed of thousands of doctors, uh, including former hospital directors, AMM has declared a strike in solidarity with the illegal AMMRI Union of Medical Students and Interns. AMMRI has announced it will be joining the AMM. In my evaluation, while the interns are generally eager to collaborate with their doctors, their leadership appears wary of losing autonomy. Both organizations demand the hiring of fire doctors and interns, increased pay, and have provided a list of hospital-specific demands see attached. Hey, look, this is looking good. Uh, <coughs> DFS personnel. While we'll continue to coordinate with the CNOP medical body to identify and publicize AMM and AMMRI members, the area CTM unions, though not in medical nature, have also offered to support the resolution of this labor dispute through public and private pressure. Nevertheless, the sudden loss of AMMRI's experienced medical personnel has greatly exacerbated the strain caused by AMMRI strike. Both the IMSS and the IISSTE hospitals are reporting extensive wait lists for all non-urgent treatment as well as an inability to perform discrete items or urgent care. The situation is expected to deteriorate further as backlogs build in the coming days. Respectfully, Captain Luis de la Barada Moreno. Forward immediately to the President. Wow. The Carrot. <laughs> The plague let loose by the fall of the Japanese, the so-called Kabuki effect, continues to rule the United Mexican States. 
One of the most infuriating developments that arose during the crisis is the doctor's strike, which paralyzes the health system of our country and thereby threatens public order. After months of having dismissed them as the subversives, which they are, and telling them to seek alternative avenues of complaint, which they should, he will invite the leaders of these self-proclaimed unions to implement reforms to the problem and finally put an end to the strikes. Betrayal. Oh boy, work a little too slightly increase. The promises I've made to the people are not limited to any conditions. All right, so if we have no empiricness anyways, I really don't want to spend too much political power, um, but we're going to spend it then anyways. Mm. So if we want this one, power will get better anyways. Farming productivity gets better. Cash crop might go up. It's either power will get better or we get more liquid reserves, which is both great. We got instead of poverty getting better, we got this instead. Helps that out just a little bit. Um, I want to do both of these first before we can click on this one because that that feels very extremely radical. Agricultural experts, yeah. Base stimulation goes up, which is actually really really good. Southeast region, how much debt would do we have? Not bad. Slightly productive, extremely productive. Can we hit 100 percent? That actually be really cool if we could hit 100 percent. Nice, nice. Yeah. Talking in circles. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Or do I say with a smile? It's always a pleasure to speak with men of your profession. I look forward to resolving your differences. The 15-man delegation from the AWM stated the nerves. Agreeing to this meeting was a step in the right direction, but they wouldn't allow the president to all overall them. They were here to present a petition of grievances and then make sure Ordaz heard every word. For a few minutes, the meeting went well. Ordaz listened attentively and even agreed with the doctors in principle. It seemed like a breakthrough might be possible. You know, Ordaz interjected suddenly, illegal work stop, which is a very serious offense. It can even rise to the level of social disillusion. The delegation was stunned. Your Excellency, the, said the lead negotiator, it's not fair to characterize the movement as criminal. He was calling you criminals. I'm merely stating a fact. Ordaz went back to being sympathetic, only to drop the phrase social disillusion again a few moments later. The mini continued in this bizarre pattern, with Ordaz alternating between acknowledging the faults in the Mexican health system and hinting that the AWM was engaged in criminal acts. After two full hours, the delegation ran out of patience. They finally asked the president to sign a resolution resolving the petition. Ordaz thought for, thought for a moment and looked at the doctors and said, I cannot negotiate with an illegal, illegal union. Crackdowns and violence. I will sign a resolution to effect. By ignoring and blocking them. A rotten apple a day. Um, I like the idea of like signing into effect, working with them, and saying, hey, we're willing to compromise. I don't really want to kill them all, you know, crack them down. We're not a dictator. Well, kind of, we kind of actually honestly are an imperfect dictatorship. But we need to l appear that we are here for the people. We're going with that one. Second strike. Interim radicals increased by 10. Second like aftermath. Intern target radicals themselves. So, where are we at with this one? Starve out approach. They're not organized. And their radicalism in the period is 20. They are disorganized. It's probably a bad idea, idea to click on that. Effect in 10 days. We can do everything here, and we will do everything here. I don't mind working, increasing worker cronyism, too. We do what we must, you know? Ooh, the DFS is not loyal. That's not good. That's very bad. Oh, wow. Their target radicalism is 60. They're at 70 right now. I kind of wish it was all on the same page. I mean, you know, I should have to open this up and see all this, too. Just, you know, do something here. So we need to lower them both. It's not bad. That's good. That's not good. We need more loyalty from the party bureaucracy, so. We'll do what we must. Good, 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 so far. Ah, it's in the storm and rotten apple day. Lupita and the rest of the Salito, Salito chapter of the AMMRI occupied the street outside the civil hospital, shouting slogans in the dry heat. Suddenly, Lupita found her voice drowned out by the deep roar of diesel engines. Three humpbacked garbage trucks were rolling down the street toward the crowd. The lumbering vehicle pulled to a stop, corralling the protesters in the street. 
The san sanitation workers jumped out of the truck sporting stained canvas coveralls with CTM pins on the collars. Almost immediately, they began to heckle the interns. Don't want to be stuck in the union with the idiot garbage collectors? You think you're too good for us? Like you give a screw about anything but your own pay. A draw whine as the sloping tailgates on the backs of the vehicle open. The workers reached onto the containers and pulled out the city's refuse. Decaying food, glass bottles, and scrap wood became ammunition for the skirmish. Lupita found herself face to face with one of the sanitation workers, a wiry man with a shaved head. He pulled a bloated, moldy orange from the truck and held it at Lupita. It burst open on her face with a smack. The smell was unbearable. The liquid ran down her face into her eyes and mouth. She spat it out on the tarmac and wiped her face. Half the crowd had already been driven away by the stench. Lupita ducked as a glass bottle soared past her and shattered on the ground. She decided she'd be safer at home. The saints would never come out of Lupita's white coat. Eyes in the storm. You made it the right thing, mess of things, haven't you, Carlos? The drowsy prudently held his tongue, gambling on Dad's remaining calm. He was right. Or Dad simply shrugged and continued on. Yeah, that's a mess, but really, Carlos, I've seen worse in my time. We would have expected a darn sight worse from Salinas if we'd failed to contain the Nav incident, wouldn't we? Or Dad smiled and Madras began to chuckle. Well, that's right, Gustavo. Darn right, he would have done far worse than either of us. Uh, knowing him for the technocratic borderline fascist that he is, the man would have found a way to deny anything was wrong with Japan and sold General Cardenas and tried to discredit the party itself in one sentence. Ordaz laughed at that. Quite so, considering that re reality, my friend. So long as you keep things reasonable, you carry on with things, rock the boat, but don't make a keel over. Madrazo nodded, his mind working furiously. A tableau of the things he could do for the Mexican nation with his permission from the president unveiled itself in his mind's eye. Sure thing, Gustavo. I'll see about doing it. So then. So then. Your Excellency, you work well enough with the Southern Cyclone for now, but all things, of course, must pass. So up to that's mechanization. No border for tourists. Merit attract him. I like this one too. I want to save this political power though. You really just don't. I, I don't know yet what else we could do here. What we're going to need just in case. So, probably going to keep it for now. We're looking okay. Ah, Northeast Baptist is very comfortable. That's good. Oh, wow. 15 back up to 15%? Good. The carrot and the stick. It was exactly as President Ordaz feared. Rather than adhering to the agreement given to them by the executive power, the doctors had committed a monstrous betrayal. Launching a new wave of strikes and duping the nurses of the Republic into joining them, they further destabilized the Mexican medical system. We can now reflect on how our first instincts were right all along. We must prioritize solutions. These treasonous medics took, mistook our generosity for weakness and now attempting to bleed us dry. They'll submit to be destroyed. This descent cannot be and will not be tolerated. Second spotlight. There's a second spotlight. Hello? Oh, second stretch right here. Okay. <coughs> See you in the spotlight. In all my time as first lady, there's no greater honor than uh, than leading the National Institute for the Protection of Children. Eva Saman, though, read aloud. It was with a heavy heart that I attended my resignation. But this organization's essential work shall continue. Eva smiled for the cameras, but inside she was seething. The IMPI had been founded at a request. While Lopez Mateos was off on as many foreign adventures, she had poured her heart and soul into the organization. Yet the PRI would not tolerate an ex-president's wife in such a public role, especially as her husband's health worsened. When Eva finished speaking, she ceded the microphone to her replacement, Guadalupe Borja, or does as his wife. She was a plain-looking woman wearing an ill-fitting dress and was clearly nervous about her during her speech. Guadalupe seemed to fit for the role of a housewife, but she lacked Eva's confidence and charisma. As the event concluded and the crowd dispersed, the two men shared a moment alone. It was very brave of you to come out today, she's Ava said in a snide tone. Excuse me, Guadalupe? Replied, I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, it was brave of you to accept this position. You obviously lack experience speaking in public, which is essential to lead the IMPI. I wasn't sure if any someone like you would be able to handle the job, but given time, I'm sure it will do an adequate job. <laughs> Guadalupe's face turned red. She looked away and didn't respond. Let's hope she doesn't hold a grudge. Starve them out. So, do we want 50 or do we want less than 50? I assume we want less than 50. And for this one, less than 30. 50 and 30. I assume. Sign agreements of the President of the Republic. Bank cooperation. Stall and excuse. Hide the decision making process. Ooh, I don't want to do that one. Incentivize FSTSE quarreling. I'm okay with that. So we need what? 30 or less, and then 55 or less. We only have so much political power here. I kinda of wanna see what this one does. Up for discussion. The gathered members of the AWM are abuzz with activity. The other professionals snuck in side chatter and mentally prepared comments on the upcoming topic. 
The debates of the AWM are unlike the halls of power with their polit politicians and technocrats, but the equal yet equal direct discussions of the unions, or the working class origins. Instead, the doctors, interns, and medical students reflect the institutions they toiled away so much of their youth in, academia. Their decisions mirror those of the lecture halls. The truth is the path forward. Identical copies of a recent agreement with the president are passed to all of the delegates. Many knew this was coming, others flipped through the page furiously as they studied the information as quickly as possible as if a test was about to be taken. Congratulations, gentlemen. One of the representatives from the 20 November hospital began. Well, on paper mere signature, these words are proof of the efficacy of our tactics and the strength of our movement. Momentum is on our side, and we wish to see further success. We should continue forward in cooperation with the government, no matter our personal feelings, on their ideology. A group of delegates from Veracruz spoke to one another in hushed whispers, drowned up by the general chair of the room. A man stands up at eye level with the previous speaker. I appreciate the desire for high spirits, but I must advise caution. A tantalizing symbolic victory is simply that, symbolic. The PRI machine wishes to quell and defuse us, a classic strategy. May I suggest further discussion before deciding your next actions? There is always time for further discussion. President Odaa sat in his office, a stack of newspapers in front of him. Doctors resumed strike. Call President offered disgrace on one, read one headline. Nurses joined strike in solidarity, read another. Unbelievable, Odaa's, Odaa's scowled. These entitled upstarts formed illegal unions and challenged us for the strike. I offered them generous concessions, and this is how they repay me, he yelled, slamming his fist onto the table. Across the room, Luis Echeverria cleared his throat. Ordaz had almost forgotten he was there. Your Excellency, this proves the unions cannot be trusted. If they will not accept our concessions, we should dis be discussing alternative tactics. A show of force to scare them into submission, Ordaz gave a wicked grin. You're right, Luis, this has gone on long enough. Call in the police, the DFS, whoever you need, just bring these doctors to heal. Echeverria matched Ordaz's grin with one of his own, as you wish. Those who reject the carrot get the stick. Well, we tried to negotiate with them, and then they said no. Alright, so... Greatly, greatly increase. Bitter medicine. Oh, we got the stick. Which I guess I read earlier. Um, yeah. Uh, the clamor in the hotel conference room was deafening. Only a few people sat at the tables. Most, including Lupita, were on their feet commiserating about their slim chance of catching the president's ear. Lupita was happy to be here, though she couldn't help but wish her first visit to the federal district had come under better circumstances. She'd been elected by the Satillo chapter to represent them at a national meeting of the AMMRI and didn't have the time or money for sightseeing. Lupita was feeling horribly overwhelmed by all the commotion when she was waved into a circle of interns on the edge of the crowd. Their handsome young man was ranting about their parent organization, the AWM. He was almost shouting just to be heard over the din. All I'm saying is that if the doctors really cared about us, they wouldn't have waited two months to go on strike. Or Daz will listen to whatever it is they want to say and he'll shut him down just like he did last time. Lupita nodded along with the rest of the group. Then why the heck should we follow their orders? She was surprised to hear herself speak, but continued when he saw, she saw the other interns were listening intently. Just because they'll back down to save their careers doesn't mean we'll have to stop too. We'll get out of the streets when Ordaz gives in. Cheers went up around the circle. Their strike would go on with or without the AWM. A Mendoza a day. Contracts terminated. Uh, a Mendoza a day. If medics seek to engage in subversion, we will send in the eternal enemy of all subversion and subversives, the ground troops. Soldiers will be sent to occupy hospitals to keep order and ensure that hospitals remain properly functional. Armed with Mendoza machine guns will, and given authorization from the said gob and said Dana to take any and all necessary action to ensure that nothing else goes wrong in the hospitals, the soldiers will scare off these assorted riffraff and traitors into submission. And that's what they absolutely deserve. We literally tried to negotiate with them and they said, nah. So right now we need to get down to 50 and 31. Ooh, intimidate union members. Oh yeah, that'd be good. Second aftermath. Radicals will increase by 10. Unions gain momentum. Increase by 3. Not good. Um, so I do want to get to 15 and decrease both by 1. Go to lower and lower and lower and lower. Hopefully more. Contract terminated. Niccolo Machiavelli once said that when gratitude it dissolves during the threats of survival, as it is better to be feared than to be loved if one wishes to inspire discipline, what better time to implement that wise advice in the present day? In addition to sending armed troops to maintain law and order within the hospitals, there's something else that President Ordaz can do to end this ongoing murder-suicide. Give a warning! Any who continue striking will be sacked and the safety of those who carry on thereafter cannot and will not be guaranteed. A clash of ministers. President Ordaz marveled at how such uh, has, has, as much his demeanor changed in cabinet meetings. As Secretary of the Interior had deeply invo been involved, pitching in his own ideas and defending them against his rivals, now he sat quietly, rising above the fighting and waiting to make the final decision. Despite decades of investment in the automotive industry, most Mexicans cannot afford a car, began Secretary of Industry and Commerce Octaviano Campos Salas. The rules instituted by my predecessor, Licenciado Raul Salinas Lozano, which requires that all cars contain components manufactured domestically, is a constant source of complaint for American companies. If we remove these regulations, prices will fall drastically. With all due respect, interjected Antonio Ortiz Mena, Secretary of Hacienda and Public Credit, <coughs> that rule is placed in there for a reason. 
Our domestic car manufacturers need protection from the American counterparts. Industrialization is a long process that requires some sacrifices, but stability is absolutely essential. Removing these regulations could un undo decades of progress. Secretary Minion, I think you've got that backwards. If flexibility is essential to our economic policy, we need to take advantage of our new opportunities. Here we have a chance to help Mexican consumers, but the Americans will not accept if we do not offer concessions. Or does put his hand up, signaling the two minutes stop. Thank you, gentlemen, but I think the answer is clear. Time to retire the rule. All regions get more stimulation. The rules should stay in place. Where is this for loyalty? Oh, we're more than fine. We can lower their loyalty a little bit. We'll drop them in exchange for lower tariffs. Uh, we'll probably go with sound retire this rule. Now what? They're at 74. That was a big, that was a huge drop. We're still looking good though. But we'll end it there, my friends. If you enjoyed the video though, please consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I'll see you tomorrow as we continue on with this terrible, terrible Doctor Strike. Thank you for watching and have a great rest of your day.